All right, good morning. Uh, if you'd open your Bible to the book of John, chapter 1, and uh, breaking from tradition, you know, Southern Baptists can break from tradition, um, and uh, this morning we are going to be in verse 14, I decided to do a different text this morning, being that uh, uh, Christmas is coming up, and uh, next week we'll have joint service, we'll be next door on the Chinese side for our joint service, and so I, I won't be preaching then, so I thought today would be a good time to preach a Christmas sermon. Uh, so we're in John chapter 1, verse 14, and then two weeks from now we'll be back in Galatians. Um, <clears throat> but if you'll turn there, uh, John is in the New Testament, uh, right after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, if you don't have a copy of God's Word or don't have a smartphone, there's some Bibles on the back bookshelf. Let me invite you to grab one of those. And if you don't own a Bible, you can keep it. Um, <clears throat> title of the sermon this morning is, We Have Seen His Glory. We Have Seen His Glory. So let's read the text, open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, I pray ask that now you would help us to see your glory in your word lord that we would in this text in the truth and in the the grace that is given to us through your word that that we would see your glory lord would you help us to not only see it but to delight in it and to um, be changed by it i pray in jesus name amen Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when the people saw the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And Moses had asked the Lord, please show me your glory. That's what Christianity is. It's asking God to see his glory. And that glory forever changing us. Jesus came to this earth as a human that we might see the glory of God. And for all of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have seen His glory. I have seen His glory. The Spirit of God has come into this body. This now is His tent of meeting. And in this tent, I behold His glory. Christmas is a celebration. It's a celebration of God, Jesus, being sent to this earth so that sinners like us could be reconciled to Him. And more importantly, so that sinners could see His glory. Friend, have you seen His glory? Have you seen His glory? This morning, I want to invite you, if you have never seen the glory of God, or maybe it's been a really long time since you have seen it. Maybe it's been a long time since you have gazed upon the glory of Christ. I want to invite you this Christmas season to come and behold the glory of God. We're looking at John chapter 1, verse 14 this morning. 
And although it may not seem like a Christmas text, I find this verse to be all about Christmas. It, it's, it's all about Christmas. So let's look at the verse here. Uh, we're going to look at it part by part. Um, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh. You know, I thought to myself, how do I preach on this word, word, right? I, I cannot tell you how many times in churches I've heard people say that that refers to the Bible, that the, and it, which is kind of weird if you think about it, the Bible became flesh. That's not what, what John means by this word, word. What, what, is, what does that mean, the word became flesh? This, this is an extremely difficult concept to explain or to teach on. The historical, the philosophical complexities of this are vast. Um, Leon Morris and his commentary on John, he spends 10 pages with like tiny little print, 10 pages to just talk about this one word. And I'm reading through it and I'm like, how do I summarize this? Well, the, let, I'll try. Uh, the Greek word is logos, logos. That's where the popular Bible software gets its name. You may have seen that a lot of people have that software. They're located up in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, Logos, that's where they get their name from. That Greek word is used 330 times in the New Testament. It's translated over 20 different ways. But John is the only one out of those 330 times that uses it in this unique fashion. John uses this word logos in a very unique fashion, three times, twice in verse one, and then again in verse 14. Look at verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So what does John mean when he uses this word, word? What does he mean by it? And more importantly, how did his audience hear this word? What did they think it meant? Well, a couple examples is the Stoics the, the logos for the Stoics, those who teach uh, uh, hard work and pull your bootstraps up and, and just grind it out. The Stoics believe that the logos was the rational principle by which everything was created. The logos was a, was a rational principle by which everything came into existence. Philo, who is a Jewish philosopher in the first cent or second century, believed that it was the ideal world contrasted with the world that we see so it's like there's the ideal world and then there's our world and he called the ideal world the logos of god general usage the logos just meant was inner thought there's two ideas for the general usage there's inner thought or reason and then there's outward expression which is speech or message this is why the word is translated as word because that's how it's generally used is word it's speech or message John may have in mind the Old Testament usage, the, the wisdom of God personified. Wisdom of God personified. If you're not sure what that word personified means or personification, it's like if you took a concept and you made it a person. Like if I wrote a, a, a play and I called it truth and truth was a person, truth is personified. The wisdom of God was personified in the Old Testament all throughout Proverbs. And so John may have that idea in mind. But I think that D.A. Carson gives the best summary definition of this. That was the best one I found. D.A. Carson's summary definition of this word. The Logos is God's powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and salvation, and the personification of that expression. Let me say it. It's on the screen, I believe. God's powerful self-expression in creation, revelation, and salvation, and the personification of that expression. So at VBS this year, I don't want to hear anybody saying that in the beginning was the Bible. It's, that's not true. The Bible didn't exist in the beginning. We, we, we've taught that at VBS before. I've heard it with my ears. I, I didn't. Our church has. All right. All uh, right. That's not what the word is here. The word is, it, it's, it's an untranslatable term for how John uses it, okay? I think what John is doing is he's taking an idea that the Greeks understood and he's using it very specifically. 
The reason why it's capitalized, you ever wonder why in verse 1 and in verse 14 the word is capitalized? The reason why it's capitalized is because it's a person. John says the Logos is no other than Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was God. And Jesus Christ was with God. In all of Greek literature and all of Greek philosophy, the Logos was an impersonal force. That's how the Greeks understood it. It was an impersonal force. But John says the Logos is not impersonal. The Logos is personal. He, in fact, is a person. A person. What's even more shocking is that John says the Logos, what? Took on flesh. And the Word became flesh. Now, John, speaking to a Greek culture here, writes that this powerful force, this principle of reason that is responsible for creating everything that we see, this logos became flesh. I like the analogy, uh, the author climbed inside the story, right? It's the idea. Flesh normally, especially in Paul, means uh, sinfulness, Right? That's how Paul uses the word flesh. The works of the flesh. Normally that means sinfulness or the sinful nature, but it doesn't have to carry that idea. Flesh can also carry the idea of hum human weakness or human frailty or human humility. And I think that's how John is using it, that the Logos took on flesh and with that he took on human weakness. He took on human humility. Leon Morris writes that the flesh is almost a, the word flesh is a strong, almost crude way of referring to human nature. Notice John doesn't say that the Logos came as a man. He doesn't say that he came as a human. He doesn't, there's words for that. He doesn't say he took on a body, he didn't, on, he didn't take on soma. He, he says he took on flesh. Why does he word it that way? The Logos, Jesus, God became flesh. I think he, he, he's getting at something here. What makes Christmas special is not just that Jesus or that God came to this earth. I mean, that is part of it. But what makes Christmas special is that God came to this earth in the flesh. It wasn't as though this was the first time God came to this earth. God is omnipresent. He's always been here. This was the first time he came in the flesh. There are few joys in my life that can compare to the day that I got to marry my wife. She made it in time just for that. Uh, and the four days that I got to hold my sons for the first time. Few things can compare to that. You wait those nine months and then to finally feel their flesh. The world had waited thousands and thousands of years. And when Mary and Joseph held this baby in their arms, they were not just holding their baby. They were holding God. They were holding God. They were holding the one who created them. Think about that for a minute. What did it mean for God to take on flesh? What did that mean? Well, let me invite you to join us on the, our upcoming Friday series, The Incarnation, this Friday. I hope you'll join us this Friday and next Friday. I'll be teaching on the Incarnation. and What did it mean? And why is this so glorious that God would take on flesh? Come join us this Friday. But for now, I'll give you two ideas. Number one. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. I'm reading the New Living Translation. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Paul is saying that Jesus was fully God before he came to this earth. The second person of the Trinity had all the divine privileges that God the Father had, all of them. But those privileges that he had, 
He didn't consider that he had to hold on to them. He had every right to hold on to them. He would not have been wrong to hold on to them, but he willingly chose to release them, to, as Paul says, empty himself. He emptied himself of his divine privileges and came to this earth. I mean, for some of us, like, not having a pillow is, is, is a privilege we're not willing to undergo. God emptied himself of all of his divine privileges to come to this earth. He willingly did it. The Father did not make him do it. And he did it to become a baby. A human baby. I know that we talk much about Jesus coming to a no-name family, to a, a no-name town, to a, a, a no-name stable. And yes, amen to all of that. But, but even before that, even before that, the, the, the very conception in Mary's womb, the reality that the God of the universe, the one who made everything we see, every beauty that we see, when we go to Paris or Mount Everest or Bali or wherever, and we see the beauty of God, that that God who made all of that would come and be a human If we ever needed proof for the humility of God, as if you struggle to think that, that, that this God is not humble, if we ever needed proof for the humility of our God, one only has to look inside the manger. Two, not only did Jesus become flesh, but he took on the weaknesses that come with that flesh. He took the weaknesses, for we do not have a high priest who, can, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Jesus is not unable to sympathize with us. He can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. I love that. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. For he was crucified in weakness. C.S. Lewis writes, God could, had he pleased, have been incarnate in a man of iron nerves. He could have came with, like, like Superman. He could have come as Superman, the stoic sort who lets no sigh escape him. But of his great humility, he chose to be incarnate in a man of delicate sensibilities who wept at the grave of Lazarus and sweated blood in Gethsemane. Otherwise, we should have missed the great lesson that it is by his will alone that a man is good or bad and that feelings are not in themselves of any importance. We should also have missed the all-important help of knowing that he has faced all of the weakest that we face. There is no weakness that we face that Jesus himself didn't face. He has shared not only the strength of our very nature, but he has also shared of every weakness that we experience except sin. If he had been incarnate in a man of immense natural courage, that would have been for many of us almost the same as, as his not being incarnate at all. What Lewis is saying is if he comes as Superman, what's special about that? But he didn't. What Lewis is getting at is that, look, there was no God button while he was on earth. It wasn't as though like every time Jesus felt pain, he pressed the God button and it released a divine dose of morphine. It didn't work that way. Jesus felt hunger in the desert. It it wasn't like a, he, the way that you feel hungry, maybe right now, multiply that by 40. Jesus felt that the same way we feel it. He felt temptation to sin. It wasn't that like when you say, well, he wasn't really tempted because he's God. No, he's also human. He felt temptation. The, the bread that Satan offered him, it wasn't like dirt. Like he's like, well, that's dirt. I don't care. Like it, it looked appetizing. He felt temptation. 
He felt the rejection of the crowds. He felt the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Peter. He felt the piercing pain of nails in his hands and thorns in his brow and punches on his cheek. He felt all of this. I think Good Friday and his death on the cross demonstrated the love of Christ and the humility of Christ unlike any other event in the history of the world. But second to that is Christmas, the incarnation. That Jesus was willing to empty himself of all of his divine privileges and come and share in our weakness. Not only did he come to us, but he dwelt among us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In all other religions and belief systems, this is still true today, in all other religions and belief systems, humans and gods were always separated. This is true in Judaism. Not just anybody could approach God. Remember when God decided to send it upon Mount Sinai to meet with Moses? I read that at the beginning. Uh, God told Moses, he said, look, tell the people, don't even touch the mountain. Like, not only can you not come up the mountain, you can't even touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain, you'll die. For thousands and thousands of years, only one person had access to God. One person only, the high priest. And even then, the high priest only had access to God one day a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That was it. That was the only time that anybody went into the presence of God. Now, God's presence was with them in the ark, in the tabernacle, in the temple, but they couldn't see God. They couldn't hear God audibly. They couldn't physically touch God. But that's all about to change. That's all about to change. God saw the chasm that existed between man and himself, and he loved us enough to bridge that chasm. He came to us. We could not make our dwelling among him until he first came and dwelt among us. In every religion, in every belief system, humans are always trying to get to their God or to please their God. And here's the thing, the Greeks who John's writing to, like the Greeks were indifferent. The, The Greeks believed the gods were indifferent to the humans. Like the the gods didn't care about the humans. They are detached from the world. They care not about the problems of humans. They're mere mortals. What does Zeus care about us? We're, We're humans. But this God, John's saying this God, the Logos, he came to us. He dwelt among us. He not only cared about the world, he cared enough to become a part of it. He not only cares about humans, he cares enough to become one. The word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And the thing is, he didn't come and visit us one day. You know, I mean, that might have been enough, but, but, but Jesus... God's plan was not that he would just come and appear. I mean, you ever think about that? Like, well, could he have just come down, died on the cross, and gone back up? I guess he could have done that. But he, that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't his choice. He, he chose to come as a baby. He chose to come and dwell and live life like we live life. I like how the ISV, the International Standard Version, translates this. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Tabernacled. Now, why do they, is that just to be fancy? Why do they translate it as tabernacled among us? Well, the reason is that the Greek word that's used there is skeno. Skeno is the verb form of the Greek word, the Greek noun, skene. Skene is the the noun for tent or tabernacle. The literal translation of that is tabernacled. We just don't translate that because it sounds odd. John, John uses this word specifically because for those who were familiar with the Greek Old Testament, the culture here, they didn't read the Hebrew Bible. They read the Greek 
uh, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, like Orthodox Jews did, but everybody else read the Greek Old Testament. They read the Greek Old Testament. Greek was the language. That's what they read. They read the Greek Old Testament, and John knows this, and so John specifically chooses a word that would have been familiar with them. He's saying the Logos became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, the glory that, that once resided in the tabernacle now resides in this man. That glory that you've been reading about for centuries, it's in this man. This God, man, Jesus. And here's the beauty. One day we will all experience this those of us who are in Christ. It's not just that the disciples, you know, like, man, I wish I could have seen Jesus. You will! You will if you are in Christ. One day you will see Jesus in the flesh, the glorified flesh. He, 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 he's still a human in heaven. We'll talk about that on Friday. Behold, the, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. Literally, he will tabernacle with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Guys, if you are in Christ one day, you will see this Jesus face to face. You will talk with him. You will hear him. You will touch him. And if that doesn't thrill your heart, please come talk to me afterward. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. I love how John says this. We have seen His glory. John wants his readers to know that he and the disciples, they saw with their very own eyes the glory of God. John writes in his other letters in 1 John, this is how he begins 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Now, John is getting at the same thing Paul is getting at when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15. He's saying, look, if you don't believe that we saw these things, come see me. I'm still alive. If you don't believe that we saw a man walk on water, if you don't believe that we saw a man rise from the dead, come see me. I'm on this island. Come get on a boat and visit me. I'll tell you about what I saw. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. I like the King James uh, translation uh, of, of seeing. It, they, it, it translates, we have beheld his glory. I think that's a better translation. Or the ISV, we gazed on his glory. We have beheld his glory. Now here's the thing, there was nothing glorious about to look at him. It wasn't that they looked at this man and they saw the most beautiful, stunning man they ever saw in their life. It was actually quite the opposite. Isaiah said he wasn't beautiful. There was nothing glorious to look at him but every time he did a sign every time he did a miracle he manifested his glory the first sign he did this the first of his signs jesus did at cana in galilee and he manifested his glory he manifested his glory right before their eyes when he turned the water into wine and his disciples believed in him jesus did these signs and these miracles publicly Amazement seized them all. They glorified God and they were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. 
Every time the dead were raised, we have seen His glory. Every time the lame walked, we have seen His glory. Every time the eyes of the blind were opened, we have seen His glory. Every time the deaf's ears were opened, we have seen His glory. Every time the mute, the mute spoke, we have seen His glory. Every time the demons were cast out, we have seen His glory. Every time the sick were healed we have seen his glory every time uh, th th those with infirmities were healed of it we have seen his glory when he walked on the water we have seen his glory when he fed the five thousand we saw his glory when he reattached a severed ear we have seen his glory when he transfigured before our very eyes we have seen his glory when he spoke with authority we have seen his glory when we witnessed and saw a crucified man. John stood at the cross and watched his Savior breathe his last breath. And then three days later saw him alive. We have seen his glory. That's why John and Peter are willing to be flogged for Christ. Why they consider it joyful. Why they were considered, they had joy. They were worthy to be flogged for Christ. Why? Because they said, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They saw the glory of of God in the flesh. Friend, have you seen the glory of God? I assure you, if you have, there's no mistaking it. You might say, well, well I, I wasn't there. I, I haven't seen a miracle. Yes, you have. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you open your Bible, do you see the glory of God? When you sing a worship song, do you see the glory of God? When you see a sinner weeping over the forgiveness that is offered to them, do you see the glory of God? Christianity is an invitation to come and see His glory. That's what Christianity is. And when you see His glory, we are changed. Guys, when you come to the, the Word, I dare say that one of two things. When, if you read this consistently, you either will be changed or you may not have the Spirit of God in you because you cannot see His glory and not be changed. You cannot. Christianity is seeing the glory of Jesus Christ and not being the same. Not being the same. His glory changes our hungers. It changes our desires. It changes our pursuits. It changes our dreams. We no longer strive for the glory of this world. We no longer strive for the glory of self. We are hungry for the glory of God. It's like a uh, I don't even know an example. Like uh, I just made this up on the spot, but uh, my mom. Uh, sorry, mom. I know you're going to watch this. My mom made uh, the blandest grits growing up. I don't know if you all know what grits are, but uh, it was just like it was awful, and we would eat it. And then I, so I love you, mom. Uh, <laughs> 
I got married and my wife made grits for me the first time. And I was like, oh my, these are so good. What? <laughs> chicken stock. Chicken stock. Why did my mom not know this? What is my point? <laughs> my, my point is, is that many of us are, 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 are nibbling on the world. When you come and see his glory, you taste his glory, you don't go back. You don't want to go back. You won't go back. You have been satisfied with something that can, nothing can compare to it. There, there's nothing, not work, not paychecks, not homes, not possessions, not marriage, not children. My wife does not satisfy me like God does. And she rejoices in that. She is the least person offended by that. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory is of the only Son from the Father. What does that mean? Why does he include this? Why does he give this extra phrase here? ESV and NRSV have only Son. NASV has only begotten. NIV and the Net and the CSB have one and only Son. ISV has unique Son. Now, if you want to know more about that, I just finished teaching on this not too long ago about what does it mean that Jesus is a Son? What does that mean? Uh, I, I think any of those are good translations because they each bring out a difficult, uh, a different nuance to this difficult concept. And think about this. Why, why does he say glory is of the one and only son or the only son or the unique son? Well, when we're justified, God makes us sons and daughters. So I, I'm a son of God. If you're in Christ, you're a son of God. But what is it? So what does it mean that Jesus is his only son? Well, I think the be, the, maybe the better way to think of Jesus is his unique son. He's the only begotten, which begotten is a weird translation because it's like, what does that mean? Uh, uh, let me give you an example. Like a, a good analogy is remember when uh, uh, God tells Isaac to go, uh, Abraham to go and take his son, Isaac. He says, go and take your one and only son to go sacrifice him. Well, Isaac wasn't his one and only son. He had Ishmael. Well, what do you mean that take my one and only son? What God was getting at, go take your unique son. Go take your son that is the only son of promise. Isaac, something was unique about Isaac. In the same way, there's something unique about Jesus. What's unique about Jesus? He possesses the glory of the Father. He possesses the glory of the Father. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. What that means is that Jesus shares and shared the same glory that His Father had. And now, Father, glorify me in Your own presence with the glory that I had with You before the world existed. The same glory that Isaiah sees when he looks into the heavens and he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. That same glory dwells and this little baby. The full glory of God is contained in this little baby. I can hardly fathom what Mary thought and what Joseph thought as they held this baby. How shall we describe that glory? What does it mean that he's glorious? Well, John gives two terms, and I don't think these are meant to be exhaustive. John gives two terms. Number one, it's full of grace. His glory is full of grace. It's full of grace. The doctrine of grace is not developed in the Gospels explicitly. Paul's the one who gives us the doctrine of grace. In fact, verses 14 to 17 is the only place in all four Gospels where the English word grace occurs. It doesn't get developed until Paul. 
I think John wants to connect the glory of God with the grace of God. I think he wants to connect these two ideas. Jonathan Edwards said, grace is but glory begun and glory is but grace perfected. In other words, God's glory is manifested supremely in his grace. John Piper writes this, the apex of the glory of God is the grace of God. If the glory of God is Mount Everest, the grace of God is the peak. If you remember when Moses asked the Lord, I read it at the beginning, when Moses said, Lord, please show me your glory, God said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Notice he doesn't say I'll make all my glory pass before you. Why does he say it that way? He says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. And then as God passes by Moses, God says to him, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. It wasn't as though like Old Testament God was wrathful and then New Testament God was full of grace and truth. No. God says in the Old Testament, I am a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love abounding same ideas in verse 16 where john says that he has shown us grace upon grace he gives us grace and then he gives us grace upon that grace what makes god glorious is the fact that he can be as holy as he is he can be as transcendent as he is and yet where sin increased grace abounds more So, brother and sister, let me ask you, do you see the glory of God and the abundant grace that he has shown you? Do you, does, does the grace of God hit you like, a, like, like a, a Mack truck full of bricks? Does it completely level all your pride? To those who are in Christ Jesus, God always delights to forgive you. Let me say that again. To those in Christ Jesus, God always delights to forgive you. He doesn't resent forgiving you. He isn't thinking, oh gosh, again, Matt. He delights. He enjoys forgiving us. Now, you could take that a lot of wrong ways. He delights to show grace. He enjoys showing grace. He delights to be reconciled to his children. It is to his glory. He says, I'm going to glorify myself by how gracious I am to you, Matt. If you ever wanted to know what depth God is willing to reconcile sinners to himself, Jesus coming to this earth was that depth. If you ever wanted to know how costly and yet so freely grace is given, Jesus coming to that, this earth is that cost. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1 that God has predestined us. He has adopted us. He has chosen us. Why? Why did God save me? Why? I have asked that question a million times. Why is my sister not saved? Why am I saved? Why is this person not saved? And why am I saved? Why did you choose me? And Paul gives us the answer in Ephesians 1. So that in eternity, forever and ever and ever, I will praise his grace. I will spend eternity praising his grace. God's glory is full of grace and it's full of truth. Last point, full of truth. Glory, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus came to this earth that those who sit in darkness might see the light, might see the truth. In Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness a light has shone on them for to us a child is born to us a son is given 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prior to salvation, we sat in darkness. Some of you are still there. I remember sitting in darkness. I remember it very well. I was lost. I was confused. I was devastated at what I had made of my life. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. And then one day God shined his light into my life. And for the first time I knew the truth. Not the truth that Jesus was God. I knew that truth. But the truth that Jesus is glorious. I had heard the truth. I grew up hearing the truth. There are two things I heard growing up, roll tide and praise Jesus. I had heard the truth. I could recite the truth. I even believed many parts of the truth. But I did not delight in that truth. Guys, some of you are there right now. You know the truth. You can recite the truth. You believe the truth. But you don't delight in the truth. It's not the joy of your life. For the first time in my life, I felt how sinful I was. I knew I was sinful. There's a difference between knowing you're sinful and feeling that you're sinful. For the first time in my life, I felt how sinful I was. And for the first time in my life, I felt how glorious his grace was. That's what Christianity is. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is God coming to this earth in the flesh that we might see his glory full of grace, full of truth, and forever be changed by it. That's what Christmas is.